going about as a roaring lion. Not necessarily that he's so tough. He's roaring. He's going to be loud and obnoxious. You've met people like that. Jesus doesn't have to be rough and obnoxious. There is a power of the Holy Ghost that is here this evening. Just that confirmation, Jesus speaks. Satan has nothing he can end up doing. There is a power that is in the sanctuary this evening. And if you will lift up your faith with me, as we welcome the presence of the Lord, the Spirit of God, as we get our minds in one accord, and when we begin to worship God, we're going to have a wonderful service in the Holy Ghost. But it is the 4th of July. Happy Independence Day to every one of you. Today, America celebrates the Declaration of Independence of the United States. 244 years ago, on July 4th, 1776, the Continental Congress declared that the 13 American colonies were no longer subject and subordinate to the monarch of Britain, King George III. In this time of revisionist history, let me read you some factual, documented statements from our country's founders. You may find them educational. John Adams, the signer of the Declaration of Independence, a judge, a diplomat, one of two signers of the Bill of Rights, and our second president of the United States. The revisionists would have you believe he wasn't much of a Christian. Listen to what he had to say. The general principles on which the fathers achieved independence were the general principles of Christianity. I will avow that I then believed and now believe that those general principles of Christianity are as eternal and as immutable as the existence and attributes of God. And then listen to this vision that he paints for the early American colonies. Suppose a nation in some distant region should take the Bible for their only law book and every member should regulate his conduct by the precepts therefore exhibited. He states, what a utopia, what a paradise would this be? And then he states, I have examined all religions, and the result is that the Bible is the best book in the world. <laughs> I'm only going to read three of these to you, but man, there are, I'll give you a website you can go to. They're all documented. John Quincy Adams, the sixth president of the United States. My hopes of a future life are founded upon the gospel of Christ. The hope of a Christian is inseparable from his faith. Whoever believes in the divine inspiration of the Holy Scriptures must hope that the religion of Jesus shall prevail throughout the earth. He was, he was proclaiming missionaries go forth as preach this gospel. John Quincy Adams. In the chain of human events, the birthday of the nation is indissolubly linked with the birthday of the Savior. This is some pretty strong statements. The Declaration of Independence laid the cornerstone of human government upon the first precepts of Christianity. The third one I'm going to read to you, Thomas Jefferson, many times painted as anti-Christian, signer of the Declaration of Independence. Listen to what he said. The doctrines of Jesus are simple and tend all to the happiness of man. We all agree in the obligation of the moral principles of Jesus, and nowhere will they be found delivered in greater purity than in his discourses. He's talking about the Bible, his discourses. He states, I am a Christian in the only sense in which he wished anyone to be. Sincerely attached to his doctrines in preference to all others. I am a real Christian. That is to say, a disciple of the doctrines of Jesus Christ. How many of you believe in the doctrines of Jesus Christ? <laughs> You're in good company. You likely won't hear these statements on the evening news or in your newspaper, but our nation was founded with a firm belief in the power and the blessing of God. And our founders certainly weren't perfect. Lots of dirt you can pull up. But you know what? There's lots of dirt on me that you can pull up. But like you and I, they desired to be more like Christ, and they desired for His will to be done in earth as it is in heaven. If you're interested in reading any more about them, I'd be happy to text you out the link. It's just wallbuilders.com. It's a wonderful sight. It'll encourage your faith. It'll be good for you to share with your children. But as we worship God this evening, remember that we're joining with a host of brothers and sisters around the world, that remnant who still honor God and lift up His holy name. And as our nation celebrates independence, let's remember to give God thanks for the opportunities He's provided us for. And as we open up this service, let's thank God for that. But then let's ask Him 
to bring again a revival and a salvation for our land. Jesus, I thank you for this Independence Day that we're here to celebrate. I thank you for your blessings upon us, upon our country, upon the history that you've given us, Lord. In this time of trouble, of chaos, of lawlessness, we speak a rebuke against that in the name of Jesus and ask that the name of Jesus be lifted higher. In this nation that was founded upon Christian principles, we cry out to you asking for your help upon our nation. Ask you to bring a new, renewed revival to salvation. Pray for our president, for our Democratic and Republican leaders, for everyone who's making decisions and in places of authority. I speak an anointing upon them. I rebuke the enemy who would speak lies to them to cause them to believe a lie. Let truth prevail and righteousness rule, I pray. Let salvation come forth and let revival spring up. Jesus, we who honor you and lift up your name this evening, empower us to let our light shine. Let anointing be upon this service as we give you worship and glory and welcome you here. We honor you together in Jesus' name. Amen.
Jesus. I'm so grateful. Somebody sing hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, we praise you. Put your hands together to, the to a faithful God. serve a risen Savior. Come on, the same power that raised Christ Jesus from the grave. I call it spiritual freedom, liberty to express my zeal to the King of glory. Hallelujah, Jesus. Somebody shout hallelujah, Jesus. If he sets you free, shout hallelujah. Come on, he set me free from addictions. Come on, there's no power. There's no power. I say thank you, Jesus. Come on, this is why we're here tonight. Come on, we'll make our own fireworks. Somebody lift up the name of Jesus. With a heart of gratitude. Yes! Hallelujah!
Have you come to bless the name of Jesus? Bless his name. Come on, whatever you got to do to lay down your pride, lay down your carnal nature. Come on. You're worthy, Jesus. Come on, you're more holy than me. Come on, my righteousness is a filthy rags. You are mighty. Yes, bless his name. His holy name. Thank you for the opportunity. Promise remains, so I trust your word. I trust the power of your word. It's enough, enough to seek your kingdom first. Beyond the barren place, beyond the ocean. Sing when I walk through the waters. Thank you, Lord. 
Uncertainty, I could lift my hands. Hallelujah. God, here's my heart. Here's my words. Here I am, oh God. I trust you when I'm afraid. My trust is in you because you're faithful. You've done it time and time again. Hallelujah.
search you search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking at my aside every distraction come on looking to the author and the finisher of our faith Cause it's all about you, Lord. Yes, it's all about you. 
Hun. God, I've made this about me. I've made it about life. But it's really all about you, Lord. It's all about you. I'm coming back to the heart. God, it's all about you. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made. It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. Well, come on, just close your eyes for a minute. And put your focus, your attention, everything, just for the next few minutes, on Him. Forget about everything that's happened today, about what's happening tomorrow. Forget about every stressor that you have in your life and just put your mind upon Jesus. Won't it be great whenever we go home to be with Him? Won't it be amazing when He calls us out of this world that we've lived in uh, to become uh, home with Him for eternity? I'm telling you, when we get there, it'll all be about Him. It'll all be about His kingdom. It'll all be about His glory. So we might as well practice it down here. It's all about you. Come on, would you just sing it? Raise your hands to heaven and sing it as a, a testimony. Sing it as a prayer. Sing it as a commitment. It's all about you. It's all about you. Oh, yes, Jesus, it's all about you, it's all about you, God, it's all about you, Lord, it's all about you. Ever since you breathed breath into Adam and he became a living soul, God, it was all about you. I'm sorry, God, for what we've made this life about. But God, you're bringing us back to the heart of worship. You're causing life's issues to bring us back and put you back in focal point, God. I commit myself, Lord. Oh, it's all about you. It's all about you. Jesus. It's all about you, Lord. It's all about you. It's all about you. Oh. Yeah, it's all about you. This life of worship. It's about you, Lord. Hallelujah. It's all about you. It's all about you. When the music fades and it's all stripped away, what is our lives really about? One of these days, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, nothing else will matter. Nothing else will matter. Hallelujah. God, I want to live my life in such a way that every day that I spend here on this earth, is all about you. So that when you call me home, you will say, well done. God, that's my goal. That is my goal, is to live in such a way that you are pleased. For thy pleasure we were created. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, I love what I feel in the auditorium right now. I love this closeness, this presence of God. Brothers and sisters, this is what life's about. This fellowship in the Almighty. This nearness with God. Because this world's in a mess. And Brother Brad, it ain't getting any better. The only place I find peace and contentment and satisfaction and security is in the sweet presence as I entertain the presence of Almighty God. And more and more, brothers and sisters, He's making us aware that it's all about Him. 
Aleluia. Aleluia. Oh, praise the Lord. Sister Grant, I wish I could play like you. I'd worship all day long. I don't know how you get anything done. One of these days, as you're playing at home, practicing whatever you do, I pray the Holy Ghost come upon you, and you begin to minister to the Lord, and He blesses you how you've just blessed all of us for all these years. God just pours out a blessing upon you and your family. Come on. <laughs> you have the ministry that the archangel lost. He was an archangel, and if he can do it better than you, oh, my God, he was doing something. I just pray, Sister Grant, Brother Grant, God bless you and your home. Thank you guys so much for what you do. Hallelujah. I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord. Would you rather be watching fireworks? Folks, it's hotter than the 4th of July out there. It's miserable out there. I was glad when they said, no fireworks. Let's go to the house of the Lord. I know, I know. They removed my funny bone, my fun bone. And uh, it's just who I am. But I am glad to be in the house of the Lord. Somebody said, Pastor, you're going to omit service on the 4th of July? I said, for what? They cancel fireworks. Right? And if I had canceled tonight, some of you couldn't have been in the house of God this weekend. Furthermore, did the world stop and acknowledge May 31st this year? You don't know what that is? Today we're celebrating the birth of a nation. May 31st was the birth of the New Testament church. It was Pentecost Sunday. You believe them jokers didn't declare it a national holiday? If they didn't declare May 31st a national holiday, I can have church on the 4th of July. Are you okay, Brother Kenny? Young people, amazing treat. Brother Nick Grant promised me that you guys could social distance and be adults. So we're going to dismiss our young people, not our children, because y'all can't behave yourself. We're going to dismiss our young people to youth class. Amen. Put your mask on till you get to your seat. Then you can take it off. When you get back up, put it back on. Amen. Thank you, Brother Nick and Sister Alexis, so much for your burden, your love for, your, for our young people. Amen. We're trying to do our best to uh, abide by these laws, these guidelines from the government. Like I've said before, I'm not afraid of this virus, but I am afraid of how we're being perceived at, during the middle of it. I'm concerned about the world's perception of us in that we're trying to reach this world. I don't care about their perception of how I worship Christ. Paul said, after the manner of heresy, or some call heresy, so I worship the God of my fathers. Well, let me tell you, I don't care about what they think about me worshiping. I do care about how they feel that we care about them and how we treat this virus is, says volumes to them that we care. John Maxwell said, they don't care what you know until they know that you care. And if I don't care for their physical well-being, they certainly won't trust me with their spiritual. Amen. So we're doing our best. And I told Brother, Brother Nick, I said, please, Keep them aware. You're probably going to have to ride herd on them, but that's okay. We'll see how it goes. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. And I know I wore brown today, but I did wear, bring my red, white, and blue hanky. So I am patriotic. It don't match my suit, but I don't know. I'm colorblind. <laughs> Looks good to me. Anyway, glad to be in the house of the Lord. If you have your Bibles... Won't keep you long this 4th of July. I don't know what else you're going to do, but 
we're doing our best to accommodate the church. Um, something I'm contemplating. I don't know that I'm going to do it yet, but I just throw it out there. I talked to the pastoral staff about it, talked to Bishop and, and a few others. I'm contemplating opening the church on Wednesday at 3.30 when we teach our Bible study. I know everybody's not going to be able to be here, but some of our elderly people who are retired or uh, not working to have difficult time, i.e. Bishop, uh, finding it online. Uh, we're thinking about opening the church. We realize there won't be a lot of people here anyway. I'm going to give some of you opportunity to come and be a part of that. We're Obviously, we're videoing at church now because, well, technology is failing me. And uh, some of you, I'm, I'm sure you've noticed that sometimes our audio is not the quality that it needs to be. And so we figure we're going to be doing this for a little while. We might as well use the best equipment we have. And since we're here doing that, we might as well open the doors for those of you that would like to come and be here. There'll be no singing. We'll just come in and I'll begin to teach the way I normally do from my home. So that's just something keep in your brains. Uh, I probably won't be doing it this week, but maybe next week. Uh, I said, Pastor, is it going to go on that long? Brothers and sisters, this is us, okay? This is us for the next little bit. And um, until God gives us something better, this is what we're going to do. Now, if we had an auditorium big enough to social distance 150, 250 people, we'd have Wednesday night service. But I didn't feel it right, fair for me to, for you, me, or the pastoral staff to give them my notes and say, okay, we're going to divide up. I need you to teach this because some of this stuff that I'm teaching is, well, it's pastoral. And uh, so I feel it necessary to do it myself. The only way I can reach all three congregations is by doing it video. Also, it meets government requirements. Sister Grant don't want to come to church six times a week. <clears throat> That's what it would take. It would take three weekday services to have Bible study. And uh, then three, week, three services to have Sunday. So trying to do the best we can with what we have. And we got to be flexible and let God use us and get used to what God's doing. I, I want to say thank you so much for your, your worship tonight, the presence of liberty. And I felt I knew tonight was going to be sparse. I really did. I, I thought maybe just me and the music staff would be here. Um, people are gone. My, my chillings, two of them are in Indianapolis. Uh, Maddie, uh, she's tomorrow's her service. So, uh, uh, and I realize that this happens, uh, but I, I felt it necessary to not omit service tonight because we couldn't all be there tomorrow. So here we are in the presence of the Lord, in the house of the Lord. I, I think something special is going to happen on Saturday night. I really do. I, I have felt a spirit of liberty, and I think it's because it's a spirit of sacrifice I haven't quite been able to put my finger on it. Sunday we, is our normal day to come to worship. But those of you that are giving it up to come on Saturday nights, I feel God is going to do something special for you. I feel a special anointing. Uh, last Saturday was one of the most powerful services I've ever been in in my life. It was incredible. Brother Grant, it was amazing. Just amazing. And I don't think it's just Saturday, and I don't think it's just you. I think it's a culmination of you sacrificing your Sundays to come on Saturday, plus you spending time in the Spirit throughout the week. I was going to, I'm not going to ask this, I'm going to ask, but not by a show of hands. Just to know, just to let you know that I'm still aware and I'm still... I still feel it necessary. Don't raise your hands, but how many of you are getting in the spirit as often as possible throughout the week? I said every day because if I say periodically or whatever, we'll start excusing ourselves, won't we? So if we say every day and I miss tomorrow, I'm going to say, uh-uh, not two, not two days in a row. Can't go two days in a row, but get in the spirit. And, and, and the Lord quickened this to me, Brother Grant. 
Because the more you lend yourself to the Spirit, the easier it is for your Spirit just to flow there. And you just mindlessly be careful of that and just don't do that automatically. Pay it to get yourself in the spirit of prayer. You know your human spirit can learn how to, to speak in tongues. How do you think you learned how to speak in English? You hurt somebody, do it. How many of you recognize the dialect when you start talking tongues? You say, I've said that before. There's nothing wrong with that. But don't let yourself get sidetracked and you feel like, well, I made it there. No, pray until the Spirit prays through you. It may be in English, it may not be in English, but you pray until the Spirit begins to pray through you. That way you won't get caught up in a routine. It's easy, it's easy to get caught in routine and make some of the most sacred, amazing things routine. Uh, was it Hophni and Phineas offered strange fire? Did it for so long, Brother Hamilton, that, and you know, that fire was a fire that God started, and they preserved that fire, and they got so common with the fire, Brother Grant, they said, well, I can fake it. I could just do it by my own spirit, my own abilities. We all know how that worked out for them. I'm not saying God's going to kill you. But I am saying we gained absolute, we gained strength by the Spirit praying through us. So I encourage you, keep doing it. How many of you found? How many of you found a release in it? How many of you found help in it? Well, the rest of you start doing it, and you will. <laughs> I promise you. I, pro I told my dad the other day. My mom said, "Jeffrey, I'm so glad you're doing this." And Bishop said, "Jeff, I don't think he's ever said this to me before in my life." He said, "Jeffrey, that's revelatory." I said, well, I was getting ready to say it's simplistic, and it's elementary. And I should have been doing this all my life, but I'm sorry to say, Sister Sarah, I haven't. But I have noticed a marked difference in my sensitivity to God since beginning this commitment. God, I'm going to get in the Spirit every single day. Now, that's my plug for that right off the bat. 7.51, I'll do my best to, to close within 40 minutes, okay? Do my best, shush, by 8.30. Leviticus. Are you serious, Leviticus? Yeah, Leviticus chapter 22, verses 31 through 33. Romans chapter 6, 17 through 18, 22 through 23. James 1, 25. Now, you know if I'm going to cover all those, i got to get smoothing. But I, I've been kind of heavy. I've been pretty straightforward, and I've been... Um, well, I shouldn't say I, but God has been digging deep in our spirit in the last few weeks. And I, I just felt like it was time to take a little bit of a sila. Not that we're going to just hit the icing today, but we're just going to take a, a breath and uh, take a moment to relax in the goodness of God. Therefore, you shall keep my commandments and do them. I am the Lord. I think Moses had to throw that in there, Brother Grant. <laughs> he's talking to the children of Israel, and he says, Therefore, keep my commandments and do them. He says, Wait a minute. Uh, this is the Lord speaking, not me. Neither shall ye profane my holy name, but I will be hallowed among the children of Israel. I am the Lord which hallow you. Oh, I could, I could stop right here and preach for a long time on these two verses. I'm not going to. Maybe I'll do that later. He says, I am the Lord which hallow you, look at this, that brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord. Aren't you glad God brought you out of sin? Aren't you glad God brought you out of, out of bondage of, of sin? And where you, can you remember the pit that God found you and I am? Aren't you glad he found us and brought us out? Uh, oh, praise be to God. Praise be to God. Aren't you glad God hallowed you? Because I couldn't hallow myself. Thank you, Jesus, uh, that he imputed his righteousness to us. Now, you wear the name of Jesus. I, I said, I'm not going to do that. Okay, I'm going to go to the next one. Romans chapter 6, verse 17. But God be thanked. Oh, thank the Lord. Ye were the servants of sin. But, oh, I love that three-letter word. But, <laughs> you were, but, ye have obeyed from the heart. Not begrudgingly, 
Not out of obligation, not out of duty, but you were glad when God gave you the opportunity to come out of Egypt and come into his holy kingdom. I don't know about you, but I was so grateful when he washed my sins away, when he delivered me from my bad habits and my bad ways, and he opened up the door to the road of righteousness and showed me what I could be when I couldn't believe in myself. How about you? God be thanked you are the servants of sin, but you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine that was delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, ye became servants of righteousness. Verse 22. But now. Everyone say, but now. I'm on the other side of that. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and to the, and the end everlasting life. I was lost and without hope. I, I was dead in trespasses and sin, and my end was eternal damnation. But thanks be to God, he made me free from the wages of sin, which is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The only way we're going to have eternal life is through Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, James chapter 1 and verse 25 Anybody found that in the uh, Amplified Bible yet? Remember, that was your homework for sun from Sunday, uh, for this next Sunday, J the first chapter of James. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty. Don't that sound like an oxymoron? Law, liberty. Restriction, freedom. Don't that, s don't that sound weird to you? Whoso look at the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Thank you, God, for your word. It's a lamp to our feet. It's a light to our pathway. It's hope for our tomorrows. God, if we'll adhere to the word of God, to the law of God, we will be blessed indeed. Hallelujah. Thank you, God, for the opportunity for life everlasting. Thank you, God, that I change citizenship from this world to a heavenly one. God, I am not a citizen of this world. I'm merely a pilgrim on my way passing through. I've got a hope in you. I've got a hope in glory. Thank you, God. I had no hope. I couldn't do it on my own. But through your blood, through your sacrifice, you made a way that I could be free from sin, free from death, and enjoy life everlasting. Oh, thank you, Jesus. If you're grateful for that, would you give God a hand clap of appreciation? The most amazing thing about that is I did not merit it. I don't deserve it. You may be seated. I don't deserve it. Maybe you do. I'm not that good. Thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. Sure. Thank you. you Ask me if I want some water. Thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. Now, folks, I know, I know it's a little different, and I know there's gaps between the seats. But can we learn just to look past the gaps? Will you go ahead and amen me every once in a while so I don't feel like I'm across the street? If you believe what I'm saying, it's okay to say amen. If you believe what I'm saying, if you're thankful for the words that come, it's okay to say thank you, Jesus. Amen. I promise you I won't preach any longer. For many reasons, America was established. I'm going to do a little history lesson here. Let's not get bogged down. I'm, I'm going somewhere, okay? Money, <laughs> obviously. Expansion, wealth, exploration. Thank you so much. And the opportunity to own their own land. That's a thing of the past. If you think you own your own land, when you get done paying on your mortgage and you got it all paid off, don't pay your taxes anymore. You'll see how much you own. But at any rate, to own their own land, one of the greatest reasons was to be able to worship freely according to the word of God and not be bound to the Church of England 
and, the, and its doctrine under King Charles I. Did you know that? Separatists under William Bradford came to America and established the Mayflower Compact at Plymouth. They came over here because they were being oppressed. They wanted to, they wanted to follow God according to his word. And the, England had separated from the Roman Catholic Church. And they created their own church. It was called the Church of England. But there were some people that got into the word of God thanks to men that began to uh, uh, transcribe the word of God into English. And the common man got the word of God and got a revelation. I tell you, if you'll get in the word of God, he'll give you a revelation. And these men who were separatists, they simply separated themselves from the church of England. They won the opportunity to begin to worship God according to, the, to his word and not to man's word. And so they got the opportunity to come to America. And uh, they, were, they were supposed to come to Virginia, but they got blown off course. And they landed, landed at Plymouth Rock. It was not a good time. It was November. It's not a good time to start a, uh, it would have been a whole lot better if it had been a little further south in Virginia during the winter time. By the time uh, winter was over, half of them were dead. But it didn't take them long to realize we have this newfound freedom, but freedom in and of itself will not sustain us. Men began to be violent, and they began to resort to their own mindsets and began to do what was right in their own eyes. Was that the trumpet? And as a result, they came together and they, they devised this compact or this law, so to speak, that would govern the land. Later on, John Winthrop led over a thousand Puritans, again, people that had separated themselves from the Church of England to Massachusetts Bay, and they designed a government around the Word of God. They came over in the spirit of freedom, Brother Grant. But as soon as they got there, they realized there has got to be something that guards the perimeters of our life. We want freedom, but there's got to be some perimeters for that freedom. I want to talk to you today about the law of liberty. The law of liberty. Freedom was perhaps the most common denominator for all the reasons for them to come to America. Freedom from the tyranny of the corrupt government that oppressed the people. Freedom uh, for, for, their, for choices in how to worship. Freedom for their own properties. Freedom for, for their own uh, agriculture. Freedom just to have the life and liberty in pursuit of happiness on their own. Fortunately, the new world was discovered so they had a place to go. Eventually, there became 13 colonies that would call themselves states, which decided that being separate from England was not enough, but they must become independent from England. And on this day, July the 4th in 1776, those 13 states united themselves in an effort to become their own country and declared themselves completely independent from the tyranny of England. It wasn't long, though, before they realized that freedom in and of itself would not lead them to success. In fact, man was not created to be independent and therefore to become self-destructive. So just like the pilgrims, they realized that they're going to have to have a law to submit themselves to whereby each one could follow a behavior that would benefit the whole and not just the individual. So did you know that just after a few days of the Declaration of Independence, Brother Grant, that they put together a committee of five that would compile the Articles of Confederation? They realized uh, we're going to be independent from England, but we can't be in independent from one another. We've got to be united. In order for there to be un unity among us, there's got to be a law that governs that liberty. You know where I'm going. You see where I'm going. We as Americans, we hold on dearly to the rights and to the laws of the Constitution that eventually became the signing of the, the, Const the Con signing of the Declaration of Independence and then there came the, the Articles of Confederation and they, out of the Articles of Confederation, 10 years later would come the Constitution of the United States and enclosed in that was a Bill of Rights. And we hold on to those dearly as Americans. Why? Because it's a law by which the government as well as the citizens fulfill our pursuits of life, liberty, and happiness. 
I'm grateful for the freedoms that we enjoy in this country. I appreciate the freedom of speech. I really do. I appreciate the freedoms of speech that we have and and religion and opportunity to pursue our lives within the laws of this land. I know she's not perfect. You and I are in it. I said, I know she's not perfect. She's governed with imperfect men. However, I'm still proud to be called an American citizen. I'm grateful that God saw fit that I would be born within her borders. And with this grateful heart, I enjoy the multitudes of choices, of opportunities that I have in this great country. You could choose your own occupation. You can choose where you want to live. You could choose what education appeals to you. We even get to choose what religion we wish to practice openly. My goodness, go to the grocery store and try to choose which chocolate ice cream you want. None for me, I'll take vanilla. But there are so many choices. Now go to Africa, there's two choices of chocolate, one choice of vanilla, and one choice of strawberry. In a developed African country. We, that, that, that's just an illustration, a small illustration of the choices that we have in America. You don't like that job? Go ahead, quit, get an education, go start another one. Amazing country. The freedom that gives us this great opportunity, though, came at a great cost. Have you ever wondered what happened to the 56 men who signed that Declaration of Independence? Let me just give you a a heads up. Five signers were captured by the British as traitors and tortured before they died. Twelve had their homes ransacked and burned. Two lost their sons in the Revolutionary Army. Another had two sons captured. Nine of the 56 fought and died from wounds or hardships of that Revolutionary War that they declared independence. They signed, they pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. What kind of men were they? 24 were lawyers and jurists. 11 were merchants. 9 were farmers and large plantation owners. Men of means and well-educated. But they signed that Declaration of Independence knowing full well that the penalty would be death if they were captured. The cost of liberty... Carter Braxton of Virginia, a wealthy planter and trader, saw his ship swept from the seas by the British Navy. He sold his home and his properties to pay his debts and died in rags. Thomas McKean was so hounded by the British that he was forced to move his family almost constantly. He served in the Congress without pay and his family was kept in hiding. His possessions were all taken from him and his poverty was his reward. Vandals, soldiers, both looted the properties of Ellery, Clymer, Hall, Walton, Gwinnett, Hayward, Rutledge, and Middleton, all signers. At the Battle of Yorktown, Thomas Nelson Jr. noted that the British General Cornwallis had taken over the Nelson home for his headquarters. The owner quietly urged General George Washington to open fire upon it. His own home was destroyed and he died bankrupt. Cost of Liberty. Francis Lewis had his home and properties completely destroyed. The enemy jailed his wife and she died in just a few months in prison. John Hart was driven from his wife's bedside as she was dying. Their 13 children fled for their lives. His fields, his gristmill were laid to waste and for more than a year he lived in the forest and in caves returning home to find his wife dead and his children had vanished. A few weeks later, he died from exhaustion and a broken heart. Norris and Livington, Livingston suffered similar fates. Yes, this freedom we experience came at a great cost. Along with this great cost comes a great responsibility. For those of us who enjoy its benefits, John F. Kennedy made popular a statement. Ask not what your country can do for you, but rather, what can you do for your country? Ask not what your country can do for you. That seems to be the question of the day. What am I going to get? 
Who can I, what special interest group can I, can I get to lobby Congress for me? If this nation ever falls... It'll be because we have forgotten to invest our lives into her while demanding that she benefit us. When we begin to demand that the whole of the nation seek to please us as the individual, we have lost the unity that made this nation great. That is not the spirit of the 56 men that died and lost everything they had to make this nation a great nation. Those 56 men benefited only from seeing a country survive that would become a place of freedom for the generations that would follow. There was absolutely no consideration of themselves as an individual as they pledged their allegiance and life to this fledgling nation. A law of liberty In order for there to be liberty, there's got to be a cost. There's got to be a sacrifice. It almost, as I said before, sounds like an oxymoron. But let me tell you, without government, there is no liberty. It's only chaos that leads to the destruction of man. The Bible teaches us that the law is a schoolmaster that teaches us what is right. Psalms, I believe it's chapter 2. The psalmist said that there are those that rise up in rebellion against God and would cast off restraint. Don't want nobody telling them what to do. Don't want nobody telling them how to live. Don't want nobody telling them what's righteous. And the Bible said God will laugh at them and have them in derision. How long is it when man begins to have his own way before he falls into a destructive cycle? Here we are in America. I don't care which side of the thing you fall on, Chaz, uh, whatever it was, uh, chop. Perhaps it started out noble. Didn't say right, but noble. But it wasn't long before the absence of law, the absence of order, caused it to disintegrate into chaos. Where might makes right. That's the law of evil. That's the law of the world. That's the law of Satan. The thief cometh not but but for to kill, steal, and to destroy. The law is not intended to restrict us, but to enable us to be blessed by doing what is right. I'm not just talking about the laws of our land. I'm talking about the law of truth. I'm talking about the law of the word of God. There's so many people, Brother Grant, that say, that thing is so restrictive. That thing hinders my life. That thing confines me so much. Oh, no. Oh, no. It's a law of liberty. It frees me from sin and death. It frees me from sin. It frees me from self-destruction. It frees me from the vices of this world. It frees me from my own stinking rotten self. The law is not intended to be a shackle around your leg or a ball and chain. But it's intended, as it were, to be the guardrails that keep you and I from plunging into the abyss of self and hell. Keep us on the straight and narrow so that we can be blessed. Blessed. Look at your neighbor and tell him, I want you blessed. I want you blessed. Leviticus 22, 31. Therefore, keep my commandments and do them. I've said, I've used this illustration many times. If you want to go to St. Louis, you get on 55 South. Don't get on 55 North just because it's quicker. It's not going to lead you in the right place just because it's easier. 
If you need to go to St. Louis, you better get on 55 South. Don't get on 74 East, 74 West. Get on 7, 55 South. Listen, if you want to make it to the promised land, if you want to get to right, if you want to get to heaven, you're going to have to get on the road of righteousness. There may be easier ways, there may be quicker ways, there may be shorter ways, but I promise you there is no other way. This is the perfect law of liberty. How many of you want liberty? Oh, Brother Grant, I can't tell you the liberty I've experienced in myself the more I get into this law of the Word of God. It's a liberty of who, away from who I am naturally. It's a liberty away from shame. It's a liberty away from my shortcomings and failures. It's a deliverance in my life. And it builds faith constantly. Brother Tyson, I have greater faith right now than I did before going into COVID-19. I told you this would make or break your faith. I told you that if you would use this, God would use it to elevate who you are in him. Pastor, it's hard. Nobody ever said the road to righteousness was easy. In fact, he said, uh, what is it? Broad is the way. I got too many translations going in my brains, Brother Grant. Uh, Broad is the way. Many there be that find it, going to the road to destruction. But straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leads to life everlasting. But you can find it. Said few there be that find it. You know why? Because ain't nobody looking for it. Well, there's a broad way right there. Yeah, you can do what the world does. You can get in you can get on that same highway of bondage. There is a freedom in living for God. I, I, I understand that there are restrictions. There are things that I don't do, Brother Grant, that I used to do before I lived for God. There are some restrictions. I can't go bailing off the side of a bridge into the ocean. What a horrible restriction. I can't go sliding off the side of the road and down those gorges in Colorado and Wyoming. Why? Because God has his word as guardrails on the side uh, of the side of the road of righteousness of my life. And if I will obey that law of liberty, it'll lead me into his righteousness. It'll lead me into freedom. It'll lead me into liberty. Neither shall you profane my holy name. I'm not going to get bogged down here. I will be hallowed among the children of Israel. I am the Lord which hallow you. Let me tell you what. I couldn't hallow myself and neither can you. I've been living for God for a long time and I still can't hallow myself. By the time I think I got this thing figured out, I trip over my own two feet. I mean, if you figured that out, that's why you need to speak in tongues every day. That's why you need to pray in the spirit every day. We can't do this on our own. Well, pastor, can't I take the day off? Does Satan take a day off? Does the devil take a day off? Then no, you and I can't take a day off either. I don't want to take a day off. I'm afraid of what I'm going, I'm afraid of what Jeffrey will bring my way, much less what Satan will bring my way. How many of you learned to be scared of yourself yet? I terrify myself. I dare not lean to my own understanding. Don't profane my holy name. I will be hallowed among the children of Israel. I am the Lord which hallow you. That was such a freedom. That was such a relief. I know I keep going back to this, but you know how God hallows us? As we spend time with him. Not by coming to church and kneeling on my knee and professing my, or confessing my sins. That's how he forgives me. But I'm not hallowed yet. I've got to begin on the walk on this road of righteousness with him. I've just kind of, when, when I do that, I have forsaken my, my sins. I have forsaken the way I was. I have forsaken those things. Now, there's some character of Jeffrey that's got to come out before I can be hallowed. Remember, I've got to decrease so he can increase. That's the law of liberty. Ha! Brother Grant, I can't wait to go to heaven. I will finally be rid of this joker. I am my own worst enemy. 
Maybe you fight the devil all the time. The devil don't even have to worry about me half the time. I, when I pray, Brother Rushing, I pray, God, I wish you'd deliver me from Jeffrey. I hate who, why did you make me like this? I don't question God, but I do get frustrated with myself. And then I read scriptures like this. I am the God that hallows you. All I got to do is get in his presence, but I have to get in his presence. I've got to get into this law of liberty. Did you hear me? There is a law of liberty. Was it the lady said, brown fat looks better? Is that what she said? <laughs> I need to go tan. If that's true and that's the law, then there's something you got to do to look better if you're portly like me. You got to get in the sunshine, right? If you're going to get dark, you got to get in the sun. If you're going to be hallowed, by him, you got to get in his presence. Now, I know that was a very, very crude illustration, but it's the truth. I can't get dark if I don't get in the sunlight. I can't be hallowed if I don't get in his presence. There is a law of liberty. Look at your neighbor and tell him, hey, there's a law to this. If you'll obey the law, you'll find liberty. I am the Lord which hallow you. And watch this. He said, and I'm the same God that brought you out of Egypt. Do you know the same God that delivered you is the same God that's going to make you holy? How many of you believe God can save your soul? If God can save your soul, then he can hallow your spirit. He can sanctify who you are. Now that is exciting. God brought Israel out of bondage of Egypt, but he knew better than to leave them on their own devices. In spite of his protection and his presence, it didn't take them very long to build that altar or, or that idol of uh, that golden calf, did it? You know, and it doesn't take us too long either when God delivers us. If we don't stay in his presence, pretty soon we can go right back to our old ways. And Brother Grant, years later, Years later, they're still saying, oh, I wish we'd have stayed in Egypt. Look, still looking back at Egypt. Still, still, God's still trying to get Egypt out of their heart. Come on. I don't care how long you've been living for God. We are all susceptible. Every one of us are susceptible. I find it very telling of humanity that he led them out of Egypt and straight to Mount Sinai. So he could put his law in their heart. He didn't lead them to Canaan, Brother Alpha. Brother Alpha. I can't trust you in Canaan yet. <laughs> there ain't no way. You done proven. In three days you done proven that you cannot do what's right with my presence among you. I got to get my law in your heart. There is a law of liberty that God's trying to get in our heart that will set us free, that will deliver us. This wasn't done to bring them out of bondage and back to a bondage of another kind. Rather, he brought them out of a prison of slavery and put them on a road to righteousness that would lead them to their promised land. And that's what God's trying to do to us. We were created to be interdependent. We were created to be interdependent with God and his kingdom. I don't know about you, but I made a mess when I tried to do it on my own. You know, I was the rebel without a cause. Goofy. I'm a loner. I'd do my own thing. I'd do it my own way. It was really because I was so insecure. Didn't trust myself around other people. But I still, by myself, I made a mess. Somebody made a movie. I think it was, uh, what was that? Tyler Perry. I could do bad all by myself. That was me. That was me. James 1.25, but whoso looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues there and look at your neighbor and tell him, continue in this. Don't just visit it. You know, they walked around that mountain of Sinai for a year. It took a year for God to say, okay, you've marched around this mountain long enough. Turn north. It took a year for them to get it in their heart. I don't know how long it's taken for God to pound this into my head. It's, I'm hard-headed. 
But when he finally did, whoso looks into the law of liberty and continues, don't be a forgetful hearer. Listen, when you hear these words, whenever we hear, read the word of God, you ever read the word of God, you go, oh, I've never seen that before. Man, that's powerful. That just spoke to my heart. Anybody ever done that before? Don't forget that. That's God. Don't just look at it and go, boy, that's good. Look at it and realize, that's for me. Now go find a place to pray and pray it into your life and keep praying it until you see it manifest in your life, not just once. Sometimes we got to pray it in there and cultivate it and, and water it and, and, and get all the, the weeds away from it. And sometimes, you know, just create that atmosphere. How bad do you want it? I want to be a man of God. I want to walk in the law of liberty. And therefore, I'm going to cultivate a place in my life where it can make itself manifest and bring forth fruit. If you be a doer of the work, this man should notice it said work. And it would have worked. I wanted to be imparted into me. Somebody lay hands on me and make me a man of God. Somebody lay hands on me and give me a gifting. Nah. Oh, no. It's work. But if you'll continue in the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. I want to be blessed of God, and I know you do too. There's this law of liberty. It was only the law of God's commandments uh, to be saved. It was only by the law of God's commandments to be saved and live a life holy before him and enabled by his Holy Spirit that I was able to have any peace or hope in my life. It was only, the only blessing in my life came when he delivered me from the bondages of sin and made me a servant under righteousness. Well, I thought you was liberated. I, I thought you were free. I am. But I'm weak. I've got to have somebody governing my life. The sooner you and I figure that out, the better off we'll be. I've got to have somebody governing my life. And until God came along, it, was, it wasn't even self. I thought I was doing my own thing. But there was another that was pulling the strings. It was a God of this world. That's an easy way of saying Satan himself. I was a servant unto sin. Well, guess who brought sin into this world? That old slimy serpent that deceived Adam and Eve into doing wrong. So, if I'm a servant unto sin, I'm being deceived by the same old serpent that deceived Adam and Eve. And so I'm really a servant of Satan. (gasps) Did you really say that? Don't say it that way. It sounds so horrible. Look, folks, we were made a little lower than the angels. You are no... In, in and of yourself, you are no match for the angel of darkness. However, <laughs> there's another that lives within me. Come on, there's another spirit that lives within me. <laughs> Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Why? Because I've submitted to this law of, of liberty. Ah. It is through the law of liberty from sin that I'm able to serve in freedom the law of righteousness whereby I'm blessed. Yes, I gave up my independent ways. Thank God. I finally realized they were bondages that were keeping me in the tyranny of sin. I learned there's a liberty in the interdependence of the kingdom of God where I lose my selfish individualization in the kingdom. Watch this. Ephesians chapter 4, 15 and 16. Speak the truth in love. Grow up in him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. I'm not doing my own thing. I'm growing up in the head, the brain, the one that makes the decisions. That's Christ. From whom, look at this, the whole body fit, joined together. Ah, This law of liberty, I find brothers and sisters that have entered into this kingdom along with side of me. Fitly joined together, compacted that which every joint supplies. This law of liberty, this strength, this anointing that I find in the law of liberty, it doesn't just benefit me. Sister Nicole, it benefits you, and you benefit me. And Brother Charlie, you benefit me, and you benefit uh, Sister Rushing, and Sister Rushing benefits Brother Kramer, and so on, and so on, and so on. How does that happen? We've submitted ourselves to a law of liberty. Therefore, the head flows through the body. Ah, praise God. Making increase of the 
body unto the edifying of itself in love. Romans 6, 1, 17 and 18. But God be thanked, you are the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart. I had a desire to do this. God's created a desire and a hunger within me to do what was right. That form of doctrine delivered to you. Being made free from sin, I became servants of righteousness. But now, being made free from sin, I became the servants of God. I have my fruit unto holiness, whereas I used to have my fruit unto, unto unrighteousness and in sin and the guilt and the shame that plagued me as well as the bondage of, I don't want to do this. I don't want to be this way. Now I have this freedom and liberty of the law of God for the wages of sin was death oh but he didn't leave us there the gift of God is eternal life where through Jesus Christ our Lord thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord we have freedom to follow in the law of liberty where we have options to choose I can be blessed this world doesn't have the option it runs the gauntlet if I do right and nobody wants to step on my head to get to the next uh, step on the ladder, I might be able to, to be a little successful. But no, through the law of the liberty of Christ, uh, I have an option to choose to be blessed. In the kingdom of God, we have the opportunity to walk in power and dominion of the supernatural over myself, over my own situations, over my own uh, my own failures, over my own weaknesses, uh, over the own, over offenses that happen in my life, uh, over, over everything in my life. I have this power through this spirit of righteousness. No other kingdom offers us that kind of opportunity much less eternal life. Brothers and sisters, one of these days, I'm going to walk on streets of gold. And I have absolutely no right to do that. Except for the fact that I've submitted to the law of God's righteousness. If that don't make you happy, if that don't make you excited, you don't believe in heaven. Not only do I believe in heaven, I believe in hell. And I'm so glad I'm missing it. I don't deserve it. Brother Grant, the best I could hope for would be annihilation. I would just cease to exist. But Christ's spirit dwells within me. He breathed into Adam. Adam became a living soul. The soul is a part of God. It's eternal. It doesn't die. So, thanks be to God. He died in my place. And now I can live. My God, does that make you happy? You're talking about Independence Day. I am so excited about the day of independence when I came independent from the law of sin and death and I became dependent upon the law of righteousness. Ah. But just as our freedoms in America came at a great cost, so did these freedoms in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is built upon Jesus Christ, the cornerstone, and the disciples were the foundation that was laid. I read earlier to you the result of the commitment of the 56 men who signed the Declaration of Independence. In closing today, could I read to you the historical account of those 11 disciples that were left? Did you ever wonder what happened to them who pledged themselves to carry on the doctrine of Christ? We read of one, James. He was beheaded. And then it's like the scripture just stops. It lets us know that they counted them, their lives as nothing for the kingdom. Historians tell us that Bartholomew preached in several countries, including India, and was skinned alive and beheaded in Durban. James the Less was stoned and clubbed to death. And the Jews became so mad at the message he preached, stoned him, and then somebody bashed his head in with a club. Andrew was crucified, tied up down in an X-shaped cross from where he preached for almost two days before he finally died. Peter refused to renounce his own faith and it angered Nero so much he was crucified. But at Peter's request, I'm not worthy to be crucified as my Lord. Crucify me upside down. 
Thomas was impaled by a spear. James the Great was beheaded. Philip was thrown into prison and scourged until finally he was crucified. Matthew, the tax collector, preached. His preaching angered the local king who ordered him nailed to a bed, covered his whole body with paper, brimstones, oil, asphalt, and brushwoods, and set him on fire. Thaddeus was crucified in Turkey. Simon the Zealot is said to have been crucified in Samaria or axed to death. Finally, John the Beloved. Oh, he didn't die violent, no, but he was boiled in oil and sent to the Isle of Patmos. This law of liberty came at a high cost. This law of liberty came at a high cost. No, we know the sacrifice that our Lord Jesus Christ paid. Just stand with me. As you and I leave this auditorium today on this Memorial Day, marking the signing of the Declaration of Independence, let us, let us never forget that it's not just a declaration of independence, but an adherence to the Constitution that gives us our freedoms. Likewise, this freedom of the Spirit that you and I enjoy is not secured by declaring Christianity. The freedom of sin and the power of an anointed life of a Christian is directly proportional to our commitment to the commandments of God, which is our law of liberty. I know we can't come to an altar of prayer, but would you make that place where you are right there an altar? Would you lift your hands to heaven and declare your allegiance to his declaration of liberty, the law of God? That same God that saved you wrote his law in your heart. And brothers and sisters, it's not through the freedom of religion that we are blessed, but it's through the adherence to the law of God that we are kept and we have a hope for life eternal. God, thank you. Where would I be if you hadn't just not loved me enough to die, but give me your word to show me how to live a life pleasing to you and how I can find this liberty in my life and freedom from who I've been and freedom from my weaknesses, freedom from my failures. God, this word, it is that perfect mirror. And I look into it, I see your holiness, I see your righteousness. But God, before I can, before I can be overwhelmed with the glory of your righteousness, it also shows me the bloody rugged cross and the blood that was shed and the mercies of God that are extended to me and even in this place and even in this place of life that I am today giving my life to you God I, I look in this law of liberty in this mirror and I see defects I see weaknesses I see failures I, I see Jeff And at the same time, I hear you beckoning to me. Come a little deeper. Come a little closer. Come on closer to me. By my stripes you were healed. By my stripes and my blood that covers it, it will heal your weakness. By the blood and the water that poured forth from my side, I will heal every weakness in your life and I will make you strong as you live your life close to me. I know it's the 4th of July. I realize that this is not the norm. But I'm telling you, God is calling us, church, to operate in this law of liberty. Here's what this law of liberty does. It gives you anointing. 
It gives you power to be able to stand and look at the giant, as we said in the song, and declare liberty and declare victory. Looking at the giant bigger than you. You can be bigger than me, but you're not bigger than my God. Ha! You may, be, you may be bigger than I am. I may be weak in your sight, giant. But let me tell you, I have submitted myself to a law of liberty that is greater than anything that will stand in my path. And you just let me get lost and hide myself in my great, big, miraculous God. And I will come forth victorious. Hallelujah. Before every victory, there's a battle to fight. And before every sunrise, one must live through the night. Before the grave burst open on that resurrection, there's a hill to be climbed and a cross to be born. Jesus, Jesus, you know what's best. Ah, yes, you do, God. Lead on, Jesus. Now go wherever you lead, Jesus. Come on, would you raise your hands and sing it as a prayer? Oh, God, you do know, you know what's best for me. Oh, lead, lead, oh, Jesus, and I'll go. You lead, oh Jesus, Jesus, you know what's best for me, oh lead, you lead home. I'll go wherever you lead. Come on, just follow that road of righteousness. Let the law of liberty work in your life and see what God will do. I challenge you again this week. Pray every day in the Spirit. Those things that are weak in you, those things that you do not like about yourself, yea, those things that you despise, take them to God in prayer and pray about them. Those hurts that you have, those offenses that have come your way that you're having a hard time getting through, that individual that just is your dipstick minister, take it to the Lord in prayer and pray until you pray through. Pray through your own thoughts, pray through your own mindsets, pray through your own prayers until you pray into the Spirit and the Spirit makes intercession through you and God edifies or builds you up as you set yourself apart to God. I love you. I'm praying for you. Happy Independence Day. God bless you. You're dismissed. <laughs>